permaculture, organic, sustainable, all these words, good as they are, there's nothing really new there. The, we were doing these things 10,000 years ago. Whole civilizations were harvesting water runoff off the land, but you're harvesting runoff that shouldn't be occurring. Right, so you have to go deeper. Welcome to the Wise Traditions Podcast, sponsored by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions in Food, Farming, and the Healing Arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. I'm your host, Hilda Labrata Gore. This is episode 32, and my guest today is Alan Savory. Alan is a fascinating person. He has a unique perspective on what is causing our planet's degradation that will challenge all of your presuppositions. Alan was born in Zimbabwe and was educated in South Africa where he received bachelor degrees in zoology and botany. He has committed his life to developing sustainable solutions to reverse the decertification of the world's grassland ecosystems. This is important for you and me because our planet's health is directly tied to our own. Wise Traditions is supported by New Trends Publishing, home of nourishing traditions and other fantastic books on diet and health at newtrendspublishing.com and the Weston A. Price Foundation. Come to Montgomery, Alabama this November and hear speakers like those featured on these podcasts at the Wise Traditions Conference, November 11th to the 14th. Learn, eat well, and have fun. Go to wisetraditions.org for details. And now, on to the interview, which was recorded in Zimbabwe last May at the Africa Center for Holistic Management. Good morning, Alan. Good to be with you today. Good morning, Hilda. Welcome to Wise Traditions. I am so excited to be with you because here we are in beautiful Zimbabwe at the Africa Center for Holistic Management, and I think there are some really important concepts that we want our listeners to learn from you. I've heard you say that we are team humanity, all in this boat together. Hmm. What is our quest, Alan? What is our quest, you say? <laughs> well, it's survival. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I refer to team humanity because um, it's ridiculous uh, the way we're facing the situation we are with so much divisiveness politically, regionally, um, over races, tribes, all the ridiculous things. We are one team of humans. We're all humans in the end, and we're facing desperately serious situation that is building up steadily, and people are beginning to perceive that. It's generally expressed as climate change, but um, long before we had the buzzwords climate change, biodiversity loss, desertification, you know, creation of man-made deserts, I, I became extremely alarmed just watching what I called environmental degradation in Africa. So 60 years ago, I, I became extremely concerned about what I was seeing, even in wild areas in Africa. And today we have these buzzwords, but let's call it climate change, for example. That's more serious than any all wars ever fought by humanity. And here we are still... Uh, with nations making new aircraft carriers and goodness knows what, spending billions of dollars and not facing reality that that is uh, staring us in the face. So I refer to team humanity needing to pull together and focus. Okay. Well, you said spending billions of dollars, and I feel like we are all over the world. People are signing agreements to make a difference in the environment, and we're spending money. But I'm not seeing the results. Why is that? Yeah, well, you won't see results because people are not addressing the fundamental cause. If you have a problem and you don't address the cause of the problem, you only address the problem or its symptoms, you can never expect success. And you see this over and over again. It's, it's universal. So, for example, the United Nations had the millennial goals. Those pretty well failed. Now they've recently announced 17 new sustainable development goals. I can promise you now, without any fear of being proven wrong, that those will be a failure oh. because they're all addressing the symptoms of some of the cultural um, issues of, of certain groups and the, the, a few 
and all the rest are symptoms of global scale desertification. So just like they addressed the symptoms 10 years ago roughly, they're addressing the symptoms again. They're excited about them, and I will promise your entire audience and the world now that there will be failures. So I hear you saying we are also all alarmed by the situation and trying to come up with principles or goals to address the issue, but we're only going after the symptoms, not the problem itself. Tell me what the symptoms are. Well, if you look at uh, the issue of global man-made deserts, which you're seeing in the United States on a big scale in the Western scale states, you're seeing it right across North Africa, up into China, that vast, most problematic region. All right, so let's just look at the symptoms of that. They are increasing droughts. They increase in severity and frequency and floods with no change in the weather, mounting poverty, increasing poverty, social breakdown, mass accusation of minority groups that inevitably arises, get blamed, any sort of minority, with that social breakdown. You get Mm. mass immigration like you're seeing to Europe or across borders into the United States from Mexico, etc. You get ideal recruitment conditions for dissident organizations like the Al-Qaeda's of this world, etc. And you get climate change. It, it, It leads to climate change as well. So these are all just symptoms of desertification. So so for some people who still deny that climate is changing or being changed by mankind at a rapid rate, that denial is frankly stupid because desertification is undeniable. Mm. Um, As uh, one speaker, Elizabeth Sartoris, put it once, I loved it, she gave a talk and I saw watching her talk and she uh, had views of the earth from space. And she said, if you had viewed Earth from space over the last 10, 20,000 years, you would describe humans as a desert-making species. Mm. It was a lovely description, I thought. Mm -hmm. Mm. And so most of what the development goals are uh, doing, most of what you see in America with noxious weed policies and trying to save biodiversity, etc., are just addressing symptoms of the land degradation. They never, ever address the cause of it. And here on this land, and that's what you've come to see, we are simply addressing the cause. And you're seeing a phenomenal difference. I mean, this is just an astounding difference. If I took you today to the nearest national parks, you'd be appalled at the loss of biodiversity you're witnessing compared with this land. And the only difference is they're constantly addressing symptoms. We're addressing the cause. And what is the cause? The cause is the way that we manage. There's there's nothing else. Let's look at a big example to show that. If we're talking about climate change, as we are at the moment, the two things that are most blamed are fossil resources, coal, Mm. oil, gas, and livestock. So these are the most, but both of those are resources. Common Sense 101 should tell any human being that a resource can never cause a problem. Uh, Yes, of course. You you see, it is the management of the fossil resources that leads us to call them fossil fuels and to burn them at a rapid rate, adding pollutants to the atmosphere, etc., all right, that is management. But we're not criticizing the management, we're criticizing the fossil fuels. <laughs> and if you look at the livestock, there's a tremendous vegan and vegetarian movement of very sincere people, but they're condemning meat eating and the animals and not the management. The, the animals are totally innocent, and they are the only thing that can help us to address climate change through desertification, etc. Ah. So we've got to get the people to just return to common sense and say, hey, something's wrong with our management. Then if we do that, we can very quickly begin to address these things seriously because most people are good, most people are genuine and trying to do their best. We've just got the bull by the udder. (laughs) 
<laughs> and when you're speaking, it reminds me of that phrase, and I think I've heard you quote it as well, the wise workman does not blame his tools. Correct. So here we are blaming the livestock and the fossil resources for yeah. our problems instead of the management of yeah. the same. And the management is what I call reductionist, and, and others call it that too. All management by humans for centuries has been reductionist. And as we've got more and more expertise and brought expert training and people doing PhDs and so on in narrow fields of, of very high expertise, it's actually got worse, not better. The, the blunders on a global scale have got worse. This is why we're facing so many tragedies coming like one tsunami after another today. But if you look back over time, many civilizations have already failed for exactly the same reason. Now we're just facing it globally. And team humanity has to return to basic common sense, good science, and change the management. I'm thinking about what I have seen here at your center, and I've seen the regeneration of the land and grass growing where it was bare, you know, a few years ago. And it's just, it's amazing. It's mind-boggling. Why aren't more people taking notice of what you're doing? Well, more people are. Thousands are. And particularly after I gave a TED talk that went out to about 4 million people, we've seen a change. Of course, the few academics and um, a few people, roughly 4%, about 96% of people responded favorably, so lots of people are taking knowledge. And through the Savory Institute, we've now got more than 30 hubs around the world where people are just networking, getting together. More and more organizations are, like your own organization that invited me to talk. That is happening. And in fact, we've got people managing holistically now on way over 20 million hectares, uh, about 40 million acres on six continents. So it's happening. But, but it's, it's increasing incrementally and, and remarkably fast for, for such counterintuitive new scientific insights. Um, but we really need a, a, something faster than that because the one luxury humans don't have is time. Mm. We've got all the money in the world, all the w goodwill and creativity, etc. Once it gets moving, we can move quickly. We don't have the luxury of time. So what I'm talking to you about today, I've been saying for 50 years, yeah. uh, while I've been ridiculed and opposed by institutions, etc., although many, a great many, individuals within those environmental organizations, universities, etc., were helping me. They couldn't change their institutions any more than I could. And institutions that control almost all policy and major developments today simply cannot adopt new scientific insights ahead of public opinion. It's never happened in the history of the world, never will. So what we have to do is just enlighten and get information to the public and when it makes sense to the public that management needs to be holistic and not reductionist things will change and change rapidly so I hear you saying even if a group sees what you're doing sees that it's efficacious they can't change it because their own supporters will become alarmed and concerned that they're headed in the wrong direction. So we need to sway public opinion first, yeah. and then the organizations will follow suit. Yes, and, the, and we only need to get the public, a significant uh, active number of the public, accepting two things. It's very, very simple, mm -hmm. that, that it makes more sense for management to be holistic than to be reductionist, Mm -hmm. Not everybody will understand what that means, but that if that makes sense to people, then institutions will change. They are already beginning to change. We have the first university hub in our savory network, Michigan State, uh, so the first university has already changed, and more will follow. And the other thing that humans need to really understand is that only livestock can actually reverse 
desertification playing its very major role in climate change. Yeah. And Alan, what do uh, your detractors or naysayers say? Well, they always focus on the livestock and say that the holistic planned grazing, which is the way that the livestock do reverse the land degradation, that's what you're seeing here. Mm -hmm. The naysayers claim that it doesn't work, and they quote peer-reviewed papers by Dr. Brisky, David Brisky at Texas A&M, others before him, and they keep quoting these same papers um, George Monbiot from The Guardian, who's quoting the same papers, mm. and they cite themselves. And none of them, not one of them, has made the slightest effort to study what I'm saying. They are all criticizing rotational grazing, concentrated grazing, all sorts of grazing systems. And we knew 60 years ago that all grazing systems fail. We knew that 60 years ago, and they're still criticizing that when we stopped doing that, as I said, many, many years ago. Oh, interesting. It's like they're, they're stuck in time, yeah. in a way. Yeah. And it's almost as if they have blinders on. Yeah. I doubt that they've come to your facility either, or any of your They will hubs. never visit. They will never visit. They will never study what we're doing. They just criticize their variations of it. We want to pause for just a moment and thank those who help keep this podcast going. Have you seen the Nourishing Traditions Cookbook for Children? Everyone in your family will love this spiral-bound, fully illustrated version of Nourishing Traditions. It's available at bookstores, online booksellers, and at newtrendspublishing.com. And keep in mind that case orders are 50% off at newtrendspublishing.com. And people like you. The Weston A. Price Foundation is committed to teaching solid dietary principles and making nutrient-dense food available to people from all walks of life all over the world. When you make a donation to the Weston A. Price Foundation, it supports educational projects, research, overseas outreach, and this podcast. So please give a gift of any size today. Just go to the website, westonaprice.org, and click on the Donate button on either sidebar. And now, back to the program. In other, when I say uh, what they're criticizing is grazing systems, all right? In management, you need management systems, but you need them only where everything is predictable. So if you and I are running a bakery or a ranch or a farm or any business, mm. we'd be very wise to use an accounting system and an inventory control system, to give you two examples. Yes. Because everything's predictable. But we wouldn't dream of running the bakery or the butchery or the dress shop or anything on a system. Uh -huh. We would manage it with process, a constant decision-making process, etc. We wouldn't fight a war on a system. You wouldn't run a business on a system. But if you had a good business running well... You would use management systems in certain areas where things are predictable. So these researchers that criticize me are constantly converting what I'm saying to a management system, like an accounting system, proving that it doesn't work, and then saying, therefore, holistic management doesn't work. It's ridiculous. It's, it's childish. I but see. it just goes on and on, and they get credibility because they are eminent scientists or academics, or whatever they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so describe to us what makes up holistic management. Help us see the big picture here. Well, what makes this management difference is, is very, very simple to get. It's every decision you make in management, all right, needs a reason or a context. So if I say to you, I'm, I'm going to light a fire or light fires, and I say, should I? Or ask you, you have no idea whether I should or I shouldn't till I tell you the reason or context. And if I'm going to light it in this fireplace here to warm the room, it's wise. If I'm going to light them somewhere else, it could burn this thatch roof down. Right. Okay. So, so in management, in the United States, in everyone's lives, we do have a reason or a context. And if you think about it, it is always we're doing it because we need it, need something, we desire something, or we're doing this to run to make a profit, or in the case of 
all policies without exception from the household to governance. We're doing, forming this policy because we have a problem. Our kids are taking too many drugs, there's too much terrorism, there's too many noxious weeds, whatever it is. So we take actions to deal with that. And that's the reason or context. That is reductionist. Mm. Now I say that's reductionist because you cannot manage anything, even in your household, without having to think about social, cultural context, the economic aspects of it, and the environmental, because we're all breathing air all the time and eating food and putting wastes out. So you, you cannot divorce these from any management. All right, so when we manage here, we have the usual needs, desires, we need to make a profit, all of these things. We have problems, mm -hmm. but we do not take our actions in that context or for that reason alone. We have what we call a holistic context. So everybody working here has a holistic context that we've developed together. And essentially, that is what is our purpose. We've clarified what our purpose is. And then we've said, what, how do we, all of us, want to live our lives? What do we want our lives to be like? To be prosperous with clean, healthy food, plenty of leisure time for social pursuits and, and so on, freedom to pursue our own spiritual beliefs, etc. We all want these things desperately badly. All right, now then we've tied them to our life-supporting environment. We've said if we want those things, what will people following us 500 years from now, mm -hmm. what will the environment here have to be like for them to be able to live a life like that? Mm -hmm. And we first described this land not as it was, bare ground, deteriorating, really bad. We described this land as abundant diversity of life and plants and clean flowing rivers, etc. All right, now that has given us a context, and it's one page, it's easy to understand. Everybody wants that very badly. Now all of our actions are taken in that direction. I so I as see. we're dealing with a problem, we're saying, will it produce that result? Is it in context with that? And that's what makes the difference here. And the second thing is, we could not. It was physically impossible for any scientist or any climatologist in the world to address the land degradation that we were facing here, as we are in most of the world's land that is seasonal rainfall, it is simply physically impossible to deal with it without livestock. So we greatly increased the livestock here, and think of them just like a tool. Uh -huh. They're like a bulldozer that doesn't use diesel, doesn't pollute, but we can't park it. It's <laughs> mo it has to keep moving every day of the year, and they have to be crawled at night to protect them from the lions. But it, they... And you saw them yesterday. Yes. You saw the cattle coming in from their day's work, five, head of 500 head of cattle. They are what has produced a flowing river again. They are what has have produced ducks and geese and fish where no one in living memory ha has known them to be. And all the grass you saw yesterday, which is more than we could ever grow in the best of years in the past, you saw yesterday and that's after nine bad years of rainfall. Mm -hmm. Now, we could be doing this all over the world, and we can do it just as fast as the public says this makes common sense. Right, right. Common sense is what comes to mind. I was thinking of an illustration. Sometimes to solve a problem um, of unemployment um, with people who are struggling and in a lower social economic tier, Someone will come up with a grandiose idea of all these people getting jobs and they'll forget a common sense piece like people need to get from their neighborhood to where the jobs are and they don't have money for the bus. <laughs> right? And that's an example of the wrong kind of thinking that's not holistic, correct? Mm -hmm. It would be an example, but there, there are many. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it really is universal. And once you understand it, you, you, you begin to laugh and see it all, all around you, uh, the, the lack of common sense in what we do. Right, mm. right, in general. And that's why we need this, mm. holistic, this holistic thinking. 
what I hear you describing also, Alan, sounds like it goes beyond um, kind of the organic, sustainable agricultural model that many of us aspire to. A lot of our listeners are concerned with their own health and with the health of those around Mm -hmm. them, and they think the answer lies in eating organic and making sure that our farms are sustainable. But this holistic concept is bigger than that. Oh, yes, it's, 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 it's way bigger, but <clears throat> it embraces all that. Now, now organic, uh, you and I could support organic, sustainable, and I say this often to people, I'm 100%, 200% behind that. We want clean, healthy, nutritious food, etc. Uh, now, organic is not enough. I have visited very prominent, award-winning organic farms, and I haven't known what to say. It's appalling. The bare ground, the loss of soil um, taking place, it's not sustainable at all. Okay, so you have to go much deeper than that. And many, many good people are understanding this in the regenerative agriculture movement. Bob Rodale first used that term that we needed a regenerative agriculture that is regenerating communities and rural life, agriculture, etc. So there are a lot of good organizations and people collaborating around that now and we're networking and working with them but what we're trying to get all of them to understand is that permaculture organic sustainable all these words good as they are there's nothing really new there the, we were doing these things 10,000 years ago whole civilizations were harvesting water runoff off the land with swales and earthworks to grow more food we can do that easily but you're harvesting runoff that shouldn't be occurring. That's a, you're using a symptom of desertification. Right, so you have to go deeper. Many years ago, centuries ago, we had nothing but grass-fed beef, nothing but organic. There were no chemicals. There right. were no, none That's of these things. That's the way things. it was, yeah. That destroyed many civilizations all around the world. In fact, civilizations only survived on major rivers or near seashores where they could bring food from vast areas. What did it take to sustain London? It took a lot of the world to sustain London and a merchant navy and a royal navy, etc. So those civilizations failed because their management was reductionist. And that's why we have to go deeper than that. As I say, when I look at the techniques that many people are using today, I can also find evidence of those techniques two, three, four, five thousand years ago, having failed in those organizations. Now, so we need to support this whole regenerative agriculture movement and all the good that is in it and just tweak the bits that led to failure in the past. So the techniques themselves are not the problem, much like livestock is not the problem or fossil resources are not the problem. It was the reductionist management that caused their failure. So if we use those same techniques today, and we're doing that, and lots of people are, but we shift and make every decision in a holistic context, those same techniques can become extremely successful. Interesting. Well, I'm eager for us to continue our conversation and especially to focus on the controversial aspect of holistic management, which is that only livestock can save civilization as we know it. I know you've said that. And so I want to ask you more about that because that is a very controversial aspect. But in general, I hear what you're saying. We can't just use reductionistic management to expect our lands and our all over the world to reverse desertification. It won't happen, yeah. Well, thank you so much for this time, Alan. I look forward to part two of our conversation. Okay. My guest today was Alan Savory of the Savory Institute. Find out more about his important work by going to savory.global or go to our website and click on the show notes for episode 32. Thanks for listening today. Our website, westonaprice.org, offers free resources to address your questions and support your journey to health. You'll find videos, articles, and brochures covering a broad variety of health topics. Wise Traditions is brought to you by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions in Food, Farming, and the Healing Arts. The content of this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for medical advice.